Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. It is episode 121. It's a nice palindromic quality to it. Uh, it's February 18th, 2019, and you're listening to, or maybe even watching, Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome. I'm joined today, as always, by Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Oh, yeah. Here we go. There he is. And, uh, hey, we got some things to talk about today. Some things. Uh, speech is hard. Uh, so, <laughs> Mediviz has launched its augmented reality platform for surgical planning. Um, I got some thoughts on that. DARPA wants to smart bandages, wants to smart bandages, wants smart bandages for wounded war- warriors. And Audi helps you avoid red lights by making speed suggestions. But first, uh, I want to remind you all that you can find us all on YouTube every Tuesday around noon. Uh, not always at noon, but around noon. So you can find us there. Everyone, please go sure to make, please go make sure to like, subscribe, do all that. That's a really helpful for us. We need more subs to get that slash name. And of course, hey, we have that HFES Healthcare Symposium giveaway going on right now. Details are in the show notes. Link is also in the show notes, but short and simple, you have a chance to win a trip to the 2019 Healthcare Symposium uh, courtesy of HFES. Uh, All the details, like I said, are in the show notes. You just enter the contest and there's your chance to win. Uh, pretty, Pretty easy ways to enter too, like giving a little tweet here and there, giving us a little review, you know, even following us on Twitter or something like that. Joining, uh, uh, like, viewing the Facebook page. I don't know. There's a couple things in there. Um, Lots of ways to enter. Yeah, for sure. But, Blake, I want to know what's going on in your world. Man, not a whole lot, to be honest, but I noticed that you had talked to me about last week about some kind of, like, fitness or food tracking app, and I, which inspired me to look back into, uh, like, my fitness pal and that kind of stuff. And I just wanted to, I had not used it in probably like two or three years, something like that. And the database for these things has just gotten so huge. I can't even imagine like the fat, like you can almost type in anything from any restaurant, fast food or regular place and get some sort of macro breakdown of the food that you are like putting in your body. And it's just pretty incredible. So I'm glad that you're bringing up my fitness pal because I am actually talking about the app that I was talking to you about last week. That's right. <laughs> so I'm talking about um, this app called U8, and it's like YouTube, but U8. Uh, and I want to compare and contrast with my fitness pal because I've also used my fitness pal. Yeah, because you, you describe kind of a totally different experience uh, using U8 than like what you would get with my fitness pal. Yeah, and okay, so let me let me describe to you my experience with my fitness pal. It's very tedious to go and sit down and and like type in, hey, I'm eating this food from this place, and um, you know it has this many calories and this many carbs. And if you're doing a meal at home, forget about it. It's like impossible to calculate exactly what goes into that without like spreading it all up right and saying like this is a meal that i go to frequently and i know what this is um so it's not very good for that and a lot of times i find myself falling off of it relatively quickly i'm talking like one or two days one or two days into actually using my fitness pal yeah um just because of the regulation and while it's really handy for figuring out what's going into your body exactly the type of thing that's going into your body um i want to compare to this other app called u8 and it focuses on the subjective side of things right so um i got a couple pictures up that i'll have jeff throw up here uh but basically if you're looking at the app you can see here's my meals um where it shows you like the time of day in which you've eaten uh you just take a picture of it and then it allows you to basically answer some subjective measures on it right like why did you eat this well I was hungry. It was a social event, and I had cravings for this thing. Uh, who did I eat with? Well, I ate this thing with my colleagues or with my partner or by myself or something like that. Um, how was it? And you can say, like, this thing was forgettable, <laughs> right? This thing was good, and this thing was awesome. Um, you, you, can al- you can also specify locations, like where I ate it. You know, like, I ate it at a table. I ate it on my couch watching TV. I ate it in my car um, or at my work desk. I can also specify things like how I made it or how it was made. Was it homemade? Was it restaurant? Was it fast food? Bakery, prepackaged, all these things. And and most importantly, kind of how did this make you feel? How did it make you feel eating this thing? And was it on track? Was it on track with what you consider 
uh, your goals, right? Sure. Was it like in line with whatever you're calling your diet at the moment? That right. Kind of stuff. And yeah. what it does is it's really interesting. So when you say, you know, this wasn't in line with my goals, it does this very subtle, like very subtle. Okay. You're off track, but that's okay. And it just gives you this little like arrow pointing back in that says, Hey, look, I'm not being like super forceful about this. You can keep going off track, but I'm just reminding you that this is not in line with your goals. And oh, it's all of you. Gotcha. And so it's really neat if you're looking at like some stats, right? So I'm pulling up here some stats uh, from from my own thing after using this for a week um, where you can see, you know, 36% of the time I was eating because I was hungry, um, you know, and just under that is because it was time. Uh, some percentage of that is cravings. And I know that this is not all uh, equal to 100% of my meals. I know I'm splitting some tags across other meals, but this just kind of gives me an idea of the reasons why I eat. Right. So if sure. I'm like, uh, and, and you see the other on there, I've, I've kind of in my head mapped that to headache. So I eat when I have a headache, ah. um, you know, and, and I think the paid version allows you to do like uh, specific um, tags. You can add your own tags to it. Sure. Yeah. Right. But you can see like 46% of my food was prepackaged. Um, and 43% of the time when I, when I eat food, it makes me feel satisfied, which is good, right? Because I... That's and, kind of what you're looking for, yeah, yeah, so you don't go off the rails. And you can see there's some, like, unsatisfied in here and still hungry in here. But it's kind of cool to, like, break it down and be like, okay, for the most part, I feel like I'm doing okay. Yeah. And it gives you these detailed statistics about, like, hey, this week, I was 100% on path. Um, and compared to last week, I was 100% as well, right? And it tells you how many meals you're having and, and how many meals you've tracked. Um, as well as kind of keeping track of how long you've been fasting for, right? So you and I actually talked about this last week where I was telling you I was uh, intermittent fasting accidentally. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and this kind of helps me push towards that goal a little more. Oh, that's kind of cool. Because I don't want to break that streak. I don't want the timer to reset when I put food in my body. So I just kind of let it keep going, let it keep going. Yeah, just let it kind of like taper out. Now, how do you kind of define what your path is in here? Because I see what you're talking about where it diverges away and it'll come back in the center. I mean, do you just choose some sort of diet strategy that you're going after? You can choose a diet strategy, but really it all comes down to your goals. So it allows you to specify goals. And this is a screenshot I don't have, but you can specify X number of goals where you go in and say like, look, I want to lose weight. I want to do intermittent fasting. Okay. I want to do ketogenic diet. I want to do a uh, standard American diet, whatever it is. Right. Cool. Um, so you specify all those and then it's up to you as the reporter to kind of subjectively report like, okay, Hey, this was probably not in line with my goals. Right. Gotcha. So it's, it's up to you and it kind of forces you to face the facts for, um, you know how how you're eating yeah so this is kind of like the almost it's not complete opposite but it's very much dichotomous to my fitness pal right which is ba which is basically taking a pretty pretty rounded estimate of just the caloric value of the things you eat where this is much more based on like how did i f how did i feel like both like feel about and feel after eating and am i like do i feel like i'm staying on track so it's i wonder like it, in terms of well, there's a difference in po the number of people that are using it, but I feel like this could make somebody be more successful on a diet path or sticking to a goal because it's more focused on like how they're feeling versus counting calories. Yeah. And that's kind of exactly how I feel because every time I go to approach food now, I'm asking myself these questions. I'm like, why am I eating this? Yeah. Why am um, I eating this? Do I really need to eat now? Am I even hungry? That kind of stuff. Yeah. Cause now I'm forced to basically answer these questions is like, uh, how will this make and I'm kind of anticipating the how will this make me feel question yeah you know, like hey this made me feel sat satisfied and happy then okay great if it's going to make me feel guilty or unsatisfied I probably shouldn't have it um, and so yeah it's I, I find this really great for somebody like me who while I love statistics and finding out exactly what I'm putting into my body my fitness pal something like my fitness pal just takes way too much time um for me to reliably do it, but this sure. is just a couple quick questions. Take a picture, boom, 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 boom. It's in there, and then I can start to see these like trends and to see kind of like a timeline of the things I put in my food rather than just text. Yeah, yeah. It's I don't know, man. It's, it's kind of changing the way I view food with, for the better. I feel like over time with enough imagery in here, you could start to try and guess, or the system could try and guess, like what caloric value each kind of plate is. Yeah, and I'm wondering if that's the way it's going to go, right? Like, 
you can there's a spot for notes so i can actually write in there how many calories i've eaten right so that way it'll give me at least a a, an idea right of how much my caloric intake is for the day nice um i could specify other things like carbs and whatnot like it's just one open note field but i have to go in to click it to sure do you like does this log into your exercise stuff too or is this just like straight up about your food and how you feel about it no this is straight up about food that's Um, cool and I've I've mentioned a separate exercise app on uh, on Infinite, but uh, no, they're separate. They don't integrate, which I kind of appreciate. That you know, this is just focused on food, and it's um, definitely. I don't know. I, I really like it. Uh, so if any of you like have had, and this is unpaid, like we don't take money. This is just a, a kind of bantery thing that I've found a lot of joy in, and I've like told other people about it um, almost to a fault. <laughs> <laughs> where I'm like, you got to use this thing. It's great. Um, so, yeah, again, not paid. This is just like a, a little bantery thing that I found success with. And if you have trouble like with fitness apps or food tracking apps, this is this is one that I would uh, recommend just for that kind of second look at, um, at kind of what you're intaking. Yeah, seems um, easy and simple to use as well. Yeah, for sure. All right, Blake. Well, it's that time of the show again. That one right there where we... <laughs> We hit the sounder and we talk about Human Factors News. This is part of the show where we talk about everything related to the field of Human Factors. This could be anything from medical, transportation, psychology, uh, AI. we got some of that VR in there. Uh, You name it. As long as it relates to the field of Human Factors, it is fair game for us to chat about on this fine program. Blake, what do we have up first this week? All right. So up first, so after two years of development, Miniviz, a New York-based company developing augmented reality integration and visualization tools for surgeons, is bringing its first product to market. So with $2.3 million in financing and partnerships with Dell and Microsoft to supply hardware, the company is launching its first project called Surgical AR. For now, Mediviz is, vi- is able to access patient data and represent it visually in a three-dimensional model for doctors to refer to as they plan surgeries. That model is mapped back to the patient to give surgeons a plan for how to best approach an operation. The interface between the medical imaging and surgical utility from its reality where we see is where we see a lot of innovation being possible for something like this. So for now, Metaviz is selling a touchscreen monitor display and headset, and the device plugs into a hospital network and extracts medical imaging data to display from their servers in all of about 30 seconds. Now, the kind of plans forward will be hopefully to basically render an entire patient from just their own medical data in the future to do these plans. But right now it's kind of based off the HoloLens, it looks like. Yeah, so this is this is pretty cool, man, seeing like uh, MRIs kind of layered uh, on top of each other to create this 3D image and this 3D space. And you can kind of like just dig around, peel back some of the layers and see what you got, you know? I mean, we often kind of... We, we've talked about this on the show before where it's like the the apparent applications of VR are video games or entertainment, but... Uh, and we even talked about entertainment last week too. Oh yeah. But now it's like at the point where you're looking at like all the, you know, components of a human body. And like, you can think about even for medical students who, who want to use something like this to learn the parts of the body. Right. Like you think about like with an exploded skull or something. Well, I feel like this is so much cheaper than a cadaver. Oh yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, this is just one of the other sort of applications of VR that is super exciting. Um, and, uh, It'll be cool to see what kind of applications come out of this, aside from learning and kind of diagnosis. Um, I'm wondering if there's like a third way to kind of view this. Well, I know that what they want to eventually do, or so the article says, is really take this one step beyond and you can, where you can get a full layout of a patient just based off of their medical data so that you could, you know plan out whatever surgical procedure you have to plan like get a full bo- like from full body of data or whatever it may be now one thing we've talked about before is like a, a training simulation that was more vr based that was trying to like get people to understand what it would be like to plan a, a specific type of surgery and have like you know tactile feedback and that kind of stuff which is more of like the training realm where this is really just focused on what can i plan for if I'm going to, in this case, or in the cases kind of the videos we're showing, if we're going to do some kind of like surgery in the skull, what do I need to be watching out for? Are there specific anomalies in this person's kind of makeup that have to be attenuated to or anything like that? So it's an awesome application to AR. 
Um, I wonder what the like translation is between like planning for it and how you execute during surgery. If there's any kind of like uptake and you're better at it because you already know the plan or you've been able to go through a model of it or something like that. Yeah. So you're talking about that that uh, application where we saw basically trained surgeons on VR cadavers or whatever. Something like that. Yeah. And and you're saying like let's take this technology and this story. Let's let's take that. Let's plan how to create the surgery and maybe marry the two technologies, right? And say, hey, look, like you can practice the surgery on this virtual cadaver, uh, and then actually, you know, perform the surgery. But you have all that body data, right? That they're collecting. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I don't know. I think it's a cool application. Uh, curious to see where it goes. Um, yeah, there's a lot of money behind it for sure. I mean, it's not like as much as some other kind of apps and stuff you'll see come out but like that's a fair amount of money to be putting but the dell and microsoft are kind of jumping behind now i know for part of it is because like they kind of made a lot of the the first iteration of this stuff come to life with the hololens so i mean they're already kind of familiar with the product and how it might be able to be used in the surgical kind of arena for planning um but yeah it'll be cool to see how they how they go further with this and i mean being able to do this in less than 30 seconds is kind of nuts and then I, I don't know like what the planning yeah. looks like, but being able to render all of this information based off the data you can pull is pretty amazing. Yeah, you're right. They say 30 seconds, uh, and they've already completed 15 surgeries in consultation uh, with this technology. So, I mean, it's like they're already moving forward with this technology, and they have 15 hopefully successful cases of this. It would be cool to know like what the... Um I don't know. I can't remember the correct term, but like what mistake, like, is there a, a lower rate of mistakes in the operating room? Oh, sure. Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. What, what is that called? Um, anyway, listeners write a, in. <laughs> yeah. I think there's a lot of different types. Like I know there's sure. flow disruptions and then there's, you, there's like just straight up things that happen with medical devices. I think there's a lot of ways to categorize it, but I, I feel like something like this should have a pretty stark impact. Cause if you like planning ahead of time, like without some kind of, serious visual model is one thing and i mean it's been of course done for hundreds of years or i'm assuming hundreds of years um but with it with like an application like this i feel like you could only get get a little bit better or have a better feel for specifically the person you're about to interact with their body for yeah so one thing that the article mentions is the touchscreen monitor um but i'm not quite sure what the application is for that is that like maneuvering in the 2d space that's what i th i'm feeling that that means because it's it, they they're talking a little bit and i think even showing kind of what they want to do in the future is render these nice 3d models but this is kind of being able to manipulate it in 2d space with the touchscreen monitor like you know pinch and zoom type of stuff is what i'm kind of imagining yeah i mean still though like really cool to see all this stuff uh kind of come together well, yeah because you're usually almost seeing it on like a film like for an MRI or anything like that. So even like just for the sake for a doctor to be able to watch an animation like this of blood moving through your Ugh, like it, body is pretty insane. It's so cool. If you haven't yet, I, I, I'd strongly recommend going to the YouTube for these like very short little clips because it is pretty awesome to kind of see this in action. Um, especially like my favorite's the exploding skull, but also the, like, yeah, that's really nuts. <laughs> that's like, that's something you could put in a real anatomy class at, yeah. any, at any grade and you would probably get a lot of interaction from it. Okay. Stick with me on this one. You, you equip a, a, uh, a trope of students with hollow lenses and you have one anchor point in the room and everybody can get up and interact with this or why not just why one an anchor point i don't know why my mind went that to that it's like you could put every you could put this in front of every student in the class and then the instructor could control all of theirs and like indicate on it in front of their faces where the thing is that they're talking about right like hey here's the cerebellum in yeah. the back of the brain like and and they could illustrate it for everybody and then the students would be able to like look around and see it all from their desk. I feel like you could take a test with this thing on. Oh my god, that'd be awesome, man! You just like point to the thing, and yeah. like, there's some. Where is the cerebellum? You have to point to uh, it. Some margin of error, at least. That would be interesting to code. All right, uh, we got two more stories this week. So, Blake, what do we Super have up crazy. second? All right, so nowhere is prompt and effective medical treatment more important than on the battlefield, where injuries are severe and conditions are definitely dangerous. And DARPA thinks that outcomes can be improved by the use of intelligent bandages and other systems that predict and automatically react to patients needs 
DARPA's Bioelectronics for Tissue Regeneration Program, or better, will fund new treatments and devices that closely track the progress of wound of the wound and then stimulate healing processes in real time to optimize tissue repair and regeneration. So a simple example might be a wound that a that the bandage detects from certain chemical signals is becoming infected with a given kind of bacteria. It can then administer the correct antibiotic in the correct dose and stop the necessary stop when necessary rather than waiting for a prescription. Or if a bandage detects that shearing for a shearing force and then an increase in heart rate, it's likely that the patient has been moved and is in pain. So out come the painkillers. So this system may require some degree of artificial intelligence but biological signals can be noisy, and machine learning is a powerful tool for sorting through that kind of noise. Better is a four-year program during which DARPA hopes that it can spur innovation in the space and create a closed-loop adaptive system that improves outcomes significantly. There's a further ask. <laughs> there's a further further ask to have a system that addresses. Oh man, osteo integration surgery for threw that one in there for yeah you. for prosthetics fitting a sad necessity for many serious injuries in, incurred during combat. Wow, that is a far and serious reach by DARPA, but it doesn't surprise me that they're both able to come up with the idea and acronym to fit the idea as well. Yeah, I, I'm always, uh, I don't know what my attitude is towards these little cutesy. Uh, Acronyms. I guess. I guess it's cool because it it get, it makes it catchy. It feels like it, which one comes first is it the cart or the horse? Because I feel like better was a somebody was like, oh, that's a good idea. Let's figure out how to make that work. Yeah. Um. So okay, let's let's break down this technology here. So this DARPA is known for some really pie in the sky sorts of uh, thinking, right? This is one of the like. I don't know. pie is in the sky is Yeah, that's what it feels like. But then it also feels like it's possible at the same time. I think that's kind of their, I don't know, that's their, their niche, though. Yeah. So, yeah. So let's let's think about the logistics of this first, right? Because that's what we do. Uh, is this possible? And how bulky would this thing be if it's secreting the right drugs for you in the moment? Yeah. It, it, does that mean that it has to... Because that this means to me that especially on the battlefield, and maybe you could do it per localized area that you're going to, like let's say in a specific part of the world, some sorts of bacteria proliferate more in wounds than others. Maybe you can have like a select number of bandages, but this really screams to me that you've got to have like a serious amount of them. Because I mean, how is one ba- I mean, how is one bandage going to be able to secrete every possible? you know, healing treatment for any bacteria or type of wound that you're dealing with. So if, I think that's a little bit, a little bit out there, but I think what's kind of freaking me out is the fact that one, they're kind of already ahead of the curve with the idea of like, Oh yeah, well, biological signals are pretty chaotic, but machine learning can already solve that. So maybe they've got a, like kind of an innovative idea that overcomes that problem of having a really bulky bandage. Yeah. I mean, even if it is bulky, even if it does contain everything, I bet you they would have like modular pieces, right? I bet you oh, they'd sure. have some sort of thing that attaches to the body and then some sort of thing that kind of sits over that attachment, depending on where it is, right? And you'd, you'd imagine you'd have several different attachments, like uh, probably like a circular thing that closes in like, uh, like one of those um, blood pressure uh, like a blood pressure monitor that you yeah, wrap around your arm? Where it just kind of contracts, sure. stays there, and then secretes accordingly, right? Uh, that's a little bulky, but it would do the job for a large gash on your arm. Oh, for sure, yeah. And I feel like something like, like that for your leg especially, is it's it doesn't sound very far-fetched when you think about it that way. No, and, and like, yeah, I don't know. It, it's, it's a cool idea. I, I'm curious to see... Um, actual implementation of this i guess i i don't know i'm a little dubious we'd have to go back a couple of years nick but we've definitely seen something that's done one of these sentences before and I'm, it's just kind of coming back to me now because they're they're talking about in the little blurb that i read is a simple example might be a wound ban a wound that the bandage detects certain chemical signals from the wound right we've heard this before like i don't i don't really know what it's it's a it would be a long time ago now, but we've definitely heard of a bandage that's looking for chemical signal changes in the body or in a wound. 
Okay. So this this seems like it's taking <laughs> it one step forward. Was this DARPA nah. before, or was it something completely different? I don't different? know. Hang on. So I found it. So this is, um, let's see here. This is, uh, it's, so if you're following along at home, this is episode 61. So if you want to go back and listen to episode 61. It's 60 which, something episodes ago. <laughs> which was, yeah, more than a year ago Jeez. at this point. Uh, that was halfway through this podcast. Wow. It, yeah, that is a long time we've been doing this. Um, so looking at this, it's uh, buh, 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 this is University of Nebraska Lincoln and Harvard uh, and MIT. Uh, they all sort of push the envelope on the smart bandage, and now I wonder if. Um, so they were looking more along the lines of like testing to satisfy the FDA. And now I'm pulling up the original article here is also a TechCrunch article, but is this was uh they're talking about like this uh, hydrogel coating with cotton thread inside and conductive coating, um, and the whole sort of uh, thing with this was that they are um, let's see here they're also releasing multiple drugs. Yeah, Sorry, I'm I'm, sc- I'm screening here on this one here, folks. So stick with me. This is live, uh, but. It looks like, you know, just a bandage or plaster. Um, uh, now, is, see, this, that concept looks really, really simple. Yeah, it does. And so I'm wondering if DARPA's thinking something more along, along the lines of this. Um, Not to play inside baseball here, but I, I wonder if, because DARPA usually grabs the, the best of the best science, and if this is stuff that's coming out from MIT and Harvard, I wonder if these those are the guys who are actually going to end up building this concept. Yeah, I'm looking in the original article Because it, fe- it feels really, really similar. Like the, Even the idea, the dose, like dose dependence, being able to you know drop the right drugs in the right amount without like having to really worry about prescription or any time passing if it's something serious. Yeah, so I'm looking, I'm, I'm, I'm tracing some of this back here as we're talking about it. And, um, you know, it looks like some research was done um, by a couple folks. I don't know their affiliation here. Uh, Maryland. What's over in Maryland? Bethesda. Bethesda. Oh, uh, National Military Medical Center. So there's there's there definitely okay. been some research on some this topic. Some kind of tie. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. I'm also trying to pull in whether or not they referenced this article that we just uh, talked about. It doesn't look like. But, yeah, I mean, they're trying to be at the forefront of technology. This seems Definitely like, not outside the realm of possibility. Yeah, for sure. Um, so this is cool. I like I like to see this technology uh, personally for me. You know, I... Uh, I want to see it for for more than just cuts, wounds, gashes. I want to see it more for, um, and, I, and it seems like maybe you could, but for more like musculoskeletal injuries, right? Yeah. Like shoulder injuries or ankle injuries or something like that. Oh goodness! If I could like throw one of these on my shoulder every time I crank it out of the socket or whatever, uh, I'd be so excited. Wouldn't that be awesome? It just pumps you full with drugs and and. Uh, collagen or something to like repair the yeah repair your joints or whatever. The that's the part that I'm most intrigued by of course is the very very last sentence in the blurb at least is how they're going to deal with osseo integration surgery for prosthetic fitting because that that definitely sounds like a combat problem yeah um and how a bandage like this is going to do that i i can kind of see it because if you're if it's detect it's almost like a a marriage between the last story and this one in some ways like if that bandage is able to detect chemical changes well could it start mapping where the wound is and then kind of spit out like okay here's an ar model of what your prosthetics going to need to look like uh based off of like different parts of the parts of the bandage picks up based off of the wound or something like that i don't know that that seems like it's very valuable to people in the field yeah for sure i mean it'd be cool to I don't know. I, I'm just I just get excited about more and more health technology. I think the more I talk to you about health, the more I kind of get jazzed about the field um, because it's not really something that I've you know had a whole lot of interest typically in the past. And uh, you know, especially like over the last couple of weeks, you've seen me get more into like fitness apps and and health apps and That's food true, tracking yeah. apps. And this is just one more thing, right? Like I don't know. It's it's cool and. Well, yeah, and anything DARPA gets their hands into, it's it always when I hear the name, I just want to at least read about it because it's it's likely going to be something on the cutting edge of technology. Whether it's, I mean, obviously a lot of it supports the warfighter, but even still, we've had different ones talking about cybersecurity that were going to be on the right. forefront. This is something that's very very similar, probably pulling from science that we've talked about on the podcast before. 
So that's just cool to read about some of the stuff they do. You know what I'm waiting for? I'm waiting for the bandage that they can slap on their robot dogs to fix their legs. There so you that go. Way they just have like robot dogs applying those uh, bandages to each other. Yeah. And I'm surprised that that's not what we see more <laughs> of is like the robot stories from these guys. But I guess they're always trying to like keep the ed- keep the the human warfighter safe too. Y- you know, I, I I know there are a lot of those stories, and it might just be my filter because I feel like those are human factors adjacent um and so that might be why you know we don't see as much of those on the show oh that's right yeah (laughs) because they're not as like directly related to what we're talking about yeah you could do like a whole podcast just on stuff that on darpa dogs darpa stuff yeah all right on that note we are going to take a break to break down the news stories right after this Human Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in Human Factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon, now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is human factors, etc. We're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all, and remember, it depends. All right, we're changing our name to DARPA Dogcast. <laughs> finally, it's finally <laughs> happened. <laughs> the DARPA Dogcast with Nick Rome, Blake Arnsdorf. Okay, yeah, uh, before we continue, I just want to thank all of our friends over at TechCrunch and Engadget for all of our news stories this week. If you want to follow along, we do post those all over our social media and our Slack channel for links to the original articles, and we post those as we find them. Sometimes it's the day of the podcast. You know, we're busy, folks. Sometimes it's a couple days in advance, so you have some time for reading material uh anyway with that we got one more news story this week blake what do we have up all right so audi's cars already tell you how long a red light will last believe it or not but now they'll help you avoid those red lights in the first place so it's launching the first implementation of the green light optimization speed advisory glosa a system that provides speed recommendations to reduce the amount of time you spend at red lights So the extension of the Traffic Light Information Technology, or TLI technology, combines your car's position and traffic light data to calculate an ideal speed that shows up on your vehicle's instrument cluster or heads-up display. So in theory, you could save time by driving slightly slower and catch an uninterrupted string of green lights. So TLI is currently available in 13 urban regions, including Dallas, Denver, Gainesville, Houston, Kansas City, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, New York, Orlando, Philadelphia is not in this list. (laughs) Phoenix, Portland, the San Francisco Bay Area, and Washington, D.C. In the future, TLI upgrades might use a car's automatic stop-start system to restart the engine when a red light is turning green and a navigation tie-in that could plan routes and minimize stops in general. So all those cities have this awesome feature. Now, Nick, have you ever heard of this concept before, that if you drive exactly at the speed limit, you're likely not to hit a red light? Yeah, I've heard that concept before, and I just want to apologize for all those, uh, <laughs> for for throwing in all those cities for you to read. <laughs> That's uh, my bad. <laughs> I just love that I made Philadelphia up. It is nowhere in there. It's not in there, but it should no. be. Um, yeah, I've heard about that concept of, of uh, driving slower to make sure you hit all the green lights and... Uh, really, it's it's just a matter of, um, you know, lights, some lights go at a specific rate. Some are hopefully tying into the smart city concept where there you, go. Uh, you have sensors on board uh, at the intersection that can detect when there are cars and um, when cars are waiting to turn and whatnot. See, that's what I always thought they were doing. I assumed that that was the way that these things function. I never really knew they might be on timers. They're... Some of them are, some of them are not, sure. right? So, like, in, in cities, some of them are on timers. And if you can sync up a car to the timers, then you can be able to tell when it's green, when it's red. And depending on your location, right, if you know uh, a couple down the line or I, I don't know much about city planning. That's how, that's my assumption. So sure, if yeah. If I'm wrong, please let me know. I'm um, curious about that. But if there are several coming down the line that, like, 
you're parked at this red light and then the next one turns green. It's like Obi-Wan going through all those force gates to get to Darth Maul. You know, you're going to hit the red light right before he kills your uh, master. And then you're just left a, uh, an apprentice with this whiny uh, boy. And then you have to train him to become a Jedi. And then, then it's the worst. And then really, what do you got? Why it's didn't like, I get through my red light? And then he becomes like your brother. And then you have to like face to kill him. And then you can't kill him. And then you like train his son. Anyway, it's this whole thing. So, I mean, just thinking about the, the gated approach, right? So the, the way that this looks in the interface, right? You, you got kind of this like suggested speed limit is like, if you go 40, you won't hit green lights or presumably um the least amount of red lights uh and so that's kind of cool right? it just tells you like hey this is your optimal speed and it's not necessarily looking at um like fuel efficiency i mean that that plays into it for sure because if you're not sitting at if you're not idling at a red light you're saving on fuel economy yeah that's true um and you know not accelerating that's another thing too so that plays into it but it's not directly like telling you that it's just saying, hey, if you want to save time, you go at this speed, even though it's like counteractive to what you might think. Go 80 and you'll get stuck at a light uh, versus going 40 and you just cruise right through everything. Yeah. If you just do the right thing, it seems to work. It's a cool little interface, too. I mean, being able to be able to see like, OK, you're going to hit a red light if you're going a certain speed is pretty awesome. And I mean, I feel like I would be more apt to just listen to what my car was telling me if I didn't have to stop. Um, so yeah, it's an awesome little between the UI and the system that they're trying to put in place. It's a fun concept, uh, and it make driving something like an Audi a whole lot more fun if you don't have to ever stop. Yeah, I don't know if you've experienced this, but there's uh, there's like a string of like six or seven lights right after I get off the freeway to get to work, and um, and some days like I'll come right off the freeway and just cruise all the way through right to work, <laughs> yeah, no stopping. Sure, other days it's like. I, I get off the freeway and then boom, I hit the light, light and I get the next light and then I get the next light. And if I had something like this, I could just be like, even while I'm on the freeway, right? If it knows where I'm going, it'll be like, hey, slow down to 65 because uh, we drive super fast here in California. Yeah. <laughs> slow down do. here to 65. So that way you can just get right off the freeway and keep cruising. Like, that would be great. I think everybody would benefit from that. Less less time driving or less time stopping or trying to speed through and like run red lights. That's the one thing that we do out here in California so much is see, I, seeing people just run red lights is nuts. Yeah. And uh, so some of the future applications of something like this, right? They're talking about potentially automated vehicles in the future. And can you imagine a world where every car has this built in to where no one is stopping at red lights anymore right oh yeah every car is anticipating the red light and i know that's not that's not f- feasible right like yeah i mean you're, you'll, it'll you'll never always be have, that feasible right you'll always have somebody waiting but i mean think of how cool it would be to reduce that by a significant amount oh it'd be amazing um, yeah so i i don't know i i'm all for this idea uh put it in my car I mean, yeah, seriously. I, w- I wonder if this will if this means because they're implementing it in so many different urban regions, if this will go into a bunch of different cars, not just Audi cars. Yeah, I mean, uh, like even a like heads up display that you can just throw on your dash and say, "Hey, look!" Like or an app, right, that integrates with the city's timers. That's the way to go, right? There. Like, yeah, you, uh, Audi could sell this to uh, other other. Uh, Google would buy people. it. People, yeah, Google would right buy away. It. Throw this right into uh, Google Maps, and then there, there you go. Oh it's yeah, like, it's it's over. It, yeah, it'll just tell you exactly what speed to drive to get there at your optimal time, and because uh, it already does that, it'll do optimal time and less waiting and idling. I, I just it. couldn't believe that they were already telling you how long a red light was going to last. Yeah, that's that's kind of crazy it's to me too. Nuts. It's like because that means they they're like having a. I don't know. They at least in the article they show these pictures of them like tying into one of the ca- camera stations that I guess monitor all the red lights. I was like, how does he even know how long you're going to be sitting there and how know. accurate is it? Because maybe I don't know. Maybe it wouldn't be as bad if you're like, oh, okay, this thing's only going to be another twenty seconds. Because there's some lights that just seem like they're going to last for eternity, and they do. Yeah, and uh, so <laughs> someone someone on Engadget. So this is the Engadget article. Someone says. The statement, in theory, you could save time by driving slightly slower and catching an uninterrupted string of green lights. They, they claim that's completely ridiculous. Oh, is uh, it? Uh-oh. You may feel less frustrated because you're moving constantly, but there's no way to get to your destination sooner than traveling at the highest possible speed at all times. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> he might be right, but yeah. how safe is that? Yeah, this person, this person needs to. <laughs> They're basically one of those people that's like, I. The only way to go t- from point A to point B is in a straight line, and that is the only way to do it. Yeah, that's hilarious. All right. Any other thoughts on this one, Blake? You ready to roll into my favorite part of the show? I really want to contact somebody at Audi and say, like, sell this to Google so I can have it on my phone. Yeah, let's do it. Let's reach out to them right after the show. Perfect. It came from... It came from... Well, it's that time again. It's time to jump into It Came From Reddit. This is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you guys, you... The one who's listening to this thing right now. The one that I am talking directly into your ear. Or in your car. Or wherever you are. Uh, I did not intend for that to rhyme. This is the part of the show. Seuss over here. (laughs) I know. This is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit. Bring you topics. Everyone else. The community. This could be human factors. This could be UX. Which it typically is. It typically is. No one posts in the human factors subreddit anymore. And 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 some people get in trouble when they post in there. Yeah, we got called out for that. Uh, But, you know, we're working on it. Anyway, so uh, check this out. Go check out the reddits. And today our post comes from, well, I guess we got two, right? Yes, we're doing both of them? Yeah, we can. Let's do it. Okay. We're doing both. All right. So for the first one, uh, this one comes from the user experience subreddit. This one's by user Bad Buddhist. I, I like realize that. that was the name. That's pretty good. That's uh, that's pretty bad. All right. So we got whose work inspires you the most and why? Uh, let's, let's see. Is there more to this? Bad Buddhist that's writes. It. That's it. What? Yep. No. That's got to be more. That's it. That's, that's it. it. All right, Blake. What what work inspires you the most and why? Well, that's a great question, Nick. No, it's so for like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. I had what forty-five minutes to think about this. Yeah, and that's I okay. have really nothing. My answer is not much better. Yeah, I don't really know whose work inspires me the most and why, and I don't know what context. Like, I would say uh, this is going to sound real ridiculous on a Human Factors podcast. But over the Joe past, Rogan. yep, that's yep, pretty much what's coming. <laughs> Joe, Joe Rogan for sure, but that's more of like, like I just think it's it's good to always analyze your ideas and not be too tied down to any one idea that you have. It'd be objective about truth and that kind of nonsense. But in terms of maybe human factors, who inspire? I'm going to be real, real soft about this and say one of my professors from grad school, Aww. who Dr. Kim Vu, who... Can't. Shout out to she, Shimbu. She wanted to slap me around when I had to work for her, I know. But she just she was one of those people that instilled a lot of hard work and a lot of determination in me from a human factors perspective and being and really focusing focusing in on, on being a good scientist and really never wavering when it came to morals or ethics and the science you did. So that that's definitely somebody who in this field inspires me. Um but yeah, that's kind of it. That's I mean, it. Right. I feel like I take a lot of my inspiration <laughs> for anything that I do outside of the direct field that I work in, um, which is probably a good thing. You that's don't, a good thing. You shouldn't be really only yeah. or I disrupt don't the space. Yeah, there you go. So, what do you got for this one, Nick? Yeah. Uh, well, Obi Wan Kenobi. Yeah, yeah. You know, Damn. he look like look. He had some stuff against him, man. He, he did. It, look, Still like does. It, his master got killed by the first Sith Lord in a thousand generations. Are you kidding me? Yep. And then he has to deal with the guilt of actually killing someone. Like, he killed Darth Maul, right? Okay. Yep. Uh, got but him. then he really didn't, because spoilers. And then he had to train this kid. Spoilers. Who, yeah. like, you know, he, he wasn't on board for it. Anyway, no, not Obi-Wan Kenobi. Um, although, I will say, like, I do take... Uh, this is going to this is gonna be, like, really cheesy and stupid, but I do take a lot of, like... Um, personal life lessons from fictional characters like and ah, that's a really kind of cop-out excuse for this this question Uh, there was no context for this question besides it came from the user experience subreddit yeah it doesn't say anything so a bad buddhist so it's about the esoteric anyway yeah you're right so i mean i do take a lot of like the jedi philosophy to heart and it's like you know find a sense of calm within yourself uh try to approach everything from an objective perspective don't let your emotions get you know, ahead of you, um, and, and drive your every decision. Uh, obviously there are times in which that kind of comes into play, but for the most part, everybody's got a little Anakin in them for, for, I mean, for the most part, like, you know, I try, I try to stick to those. And so I guess by 
virtue of creation, George Lucas, I guess. There you go. So, but I mean, like, it, there's there's names in this field that we can all point to, and we can all say, right? Don Norman, uh, Steve Krug. Um, <laughs> Are you reading from there? Yes. <laughs> Yes, oh I'm. I'm. God. I'm. I'm bringing Reddit to our our audience here. Bring Blake. it to the audience. You can also go listen to our interview with somebody who is a great mind in human factors. Good old Micah Inslee. Yeah, for sure. I mean, look, like really, what it comes down to is I'm inspired by anyone who is doing something interesting or is doing something different from everybody else. And so, yeah, take literally anybody from that swath of interviews that we've done at HFES. Sure. They inspire me. And uh, that was that that was such a great experience to sit down and talk with those people, and even o- off the air, like behind the scenes stuff, that was great too. Oh yeah, yeah. It was like just sitting down with them and kind of understanding them as a person. Uh, and some conversations even blew my mind. See, uh, see Peter Hancock, but like <laughs> yeah, see Peter Hancock and his explanation of time or uh, lack thereof. But yeah, I mean, like, so, so there's a lot of people that inspire me in that in that sense. Um, I'm just trying to think of like what has the most impact on me as a person, and it's got to be like that philosophy. There you go, man. All right, we got time for one more, and we only have one more. <laughs> we only got one more. See how I did that? Uh, this is also from the user experience ex- experience subreddit uh, by you Baumer. Uh, or is so it just Baumer? Baumer, yeah. You is the username. Uh, they write users or humans. I have been reading several articles lately that suggest we should stop referring to our users as users and instead refer to them as humans. The main thesis tends to be that users is somewhat of a negative and or derogatory term that forces us to think about humans as <laughs> objects. Somewhat similar. <laughs> I can't even finish that. <laughs> uh, somewhat similar to the view that user personas should not be fake. Instead, but instead should be based on real live human users of your products. What do you all think? <laughs> Blake, what do you think? Oh man, so I put I put this in here on purpose and you <laughs> Bec- because I feel like there's good there's two answers to this. One, I think it's a bowl of nonsense. <laughs> For sure, you ass. But that's bec- <laughs> the, and, but that there is some serious <laughs> I do. <laughs> it's been, okay. So we're folks. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's okay. Go. Okay. <laughs> Mainly, be- so this is one of those ones that I wish we had another person who wasn't so into academia or was may- maybe maybe more in the UX field and didn't like come from a super strict science background because this sounds like nuts to me just because I, I've i written so many papers that are like the participants did this and maybe to some degree using participants and users and operators or whatever maybe is dehumanizing but for for science I know that's in some, some ways important and I, I'm not saying you need to talking in a derogatory term to people that are helping you out in science but you want to like think of people as objective as possible but i also don't think that whatever word you're using is going to make it any different i I do do you really i do because look humans is a very large population users in the context of sort of another large population well think about it this way though users you're at least specifying these are the people that we're designing for. These are the people that we're talking about here. Sure. Versus stakeholders or versus it's a label on a group of people. Um, and so that, that to me, that's what it means. Right. I the, guess. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's about context here because I mean, in terms of talking about personas, like they mentioned, sure, it can be, you can get away from the user nomenclature if you need to. But ultimately, it's going to be somebody you're generating based off of a smaller population that is sure. your user set. In the sense of personas, fine. Yeah, do do away with it. They are your users, sure. but you don't have to refer to them as such in the thing. If you're trying to portray them as a real person or as some facsimile of a real person, that is a uh, th- th- that's okay to, to r- remove that terminology from there. Yeah, I just don't. I, and again, maybe it's just me not understanding clearly where the distinction is or their question it's just i mean because even 
it's even said kind of in the parentheses here. So somewhat similar to the view that user, user personas should not be fake, but instead be based on real live human users or your products. Well, as far as I know, that's what the definition of a persona is. Yeah, that's my understanding too. So then in the, I, and if you're creating personas that are based off of fake people, that's not a good idea. No. That Unless, it's, well, uh, well, if, yeah, if I, you have nothing and you it, have to start somewhere and you're going to like change it over time, okay. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it's like personas are an ag- amalgamation of data. Yeah, they're an amalgamation of real people, though. Yeah. So technically, they are they are like... They a, are based on They're reality. a homunculus. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, d- I just don't really see the... I don't find that one or the other is derogatory. I don't think users or participants or subjects... I mean, people don't like it, uh, but in ter- even in terms of personas, I mean, you're a lot of times you give these people names, so they are like superhumanized. One, yeah. they're based off of real data, and they have a lot more human qualities because they are human. You're basically just making up a human. Yeah, um, I, I'm going to pull up a really great point from some of the comments on this thread, um, and one of the one of them is like mentioning. Uh, I want to give credit here because this is a great point here. It's basically uh, I'll look for it, but but basically this person said, you know, if you're if you are designing for both humans and animals, there it would go. be an okay statement to do it then, right? Like, hey, the humans do this, the animals do this. If you're designing a system that has to work cross species, then it would make sense to refer to one group as humans versus the other. Um, I uh, you know, and there's a bunch of comments in here about how creepy it is to call someone a human, <laughs> um, they, like. Hey, I think it'd be the creepy. humans think. I don't know. Yeah, humans actually sound cold and clinical. The um, humans prefer. Yeah, you might as well just be like the cadavers prefer. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, that's my thoughts on this, Blake. Any closing thoughts on? Uh, yeah, I think we should just skip users and humans and go with meat vehicle. That's meat it. bags. Yes, there we go. All right, meat bags. Well, we are going to get out of here today. Uh, I want to thank you, Blake, for being on the show. We're not going to tell everybody where to find you yet. That's going to be it for today, though. God. <laughs> I know. Let us know where you can find Let us know what you guys think of the news stories this week. It's all falling apart here in the outro. If you are a Patreon supporter, we are going to start our Space 16 parter next week. Uh, so stay tuned for that. For the rest of you, you can just join the discussion on our Slack or follow us across all of our social media channels at HFactors Podcast. If you like what you hear and want to support the show, you can leave us a review on your podcast medium of choice or consider supporting us on Patreon. And of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. Get into the contest for one free admission to the Human Factors Healthcare Symposium in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, please see the show notes. Link is there. Uh, also, you can reach out to us on Slack, on Twitter, uh, you can pretty much find it anywhere, but please enter that. Uh, it'll be a great opportunity for many of you to go see the medical field, even if you're not a medical field practitioner. It's a great opportunity. So go out there. Uh, we're going to have some coverage either way, but Mr. Blake Garnsdorf, I want to thank you for being on the show today. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about medical VR cadavers? Oh, please. You Call can always minutes. reach out to me either through the Human Factors Cast Slack or on Twitter at Don't Panic UX. Special thanks to Jeff Olson for our video editing each and every week. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning into Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it, it does. Depends. depends.